Jensen. I'm a neuropsychologist, and this is the Hardwiring Happiness 7 Essential Strengths series. Uh, this one focused on resilience. Uh, I'm profoundly pleased to be here uh, with my colleague and someone I respect enormously, uh, Dr. Stephen Porges, and his biography is so detailed and comprehensive that I think rather than trying to summarize it, I'll actually read it to you. So he's a professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina and also professor emeritus of psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he directed the Brain Body Center. Uh, Dr. Porges is also professor emeritus at the University of Maryland, where he served as chair of the Department of Human Development and director of the Institute for Child Study. He's a former president of the Society for Psychological Research and also the Federation of Behavioral, Psychological, and Cognitive Sciences. He is a former recipient of a National Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Development Award, and he's published more than 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers. That's about 200, that's about 199 more than me, across several disciplines, including anesthesiology, critical care medicine, ergonomics, exercise physiology, gerontology, neurology, obstetrics, pediatrics, psychiatry, psychology, the inhaling here, space medicine, and substance abuse. In 1994, he proposed the polyvagal theory, which will be a major focus of our uh, interview here, a theory that links the evolution of the vertebrate autonomic nervous system, we'll explain all this, to the emergence of social behavior. The theory provides, the polyvagal theory provides insights into the mechanisms mediating symptoms observed in several behavioral, psychiatric, and physical disorders. It's also, of course, very relevant to everyday functioning and personal growth and even, if you like, spiritual practice. The theory has stimulated research and treatments that emphasize the importance of physiological state and behavioral regulation in the expression of several psychiatric disorders. And this theory provides a theoretical perspective to study and to treat stress and trauma. Dr. Porges is the author of The Polyvagal Theory, Neurophysiological Foundations of Emotions, Attachment, Communication, and Self-Regulation. I have this, th this book. I recommend it highly. Go out and get it. It actually is readable, believe it or not, and incredibly useful and interesting. And he's writing um, Clinical Applications of Polyvagal Theory, The Transformative Power of Feeling Safe, coming out from Norton 2014. And I must add two things. First, um, speaking of feeling safe, uh, around such a distinguished uh, scholar, intellect, and, and human, um, one would normally feel nervous and agitated. I actually feel very, very safe having had a chance to chat with Steve for a few minutes before this interview. And I reflected about what I'm about to say and, and can say it truly with right speech, most sincerely. I do believe that if there were a Nobel Prize in psychology, uh, Dr. Porges would have received it by now. So, Steve, thank you very much for being with us here today. Oh, thank you, Rick. That last statement kind of hit me off guard, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, but remember, uh, we don't need awards. We just need people to listen to what we're saying. Oh, for sure. It's not <laughs> about needing at all, but uh, here you are. We're talking about resilience and uh, uh, coping with, you know, my acknowledgement here, too. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Oh, definitely. We're both speaking from our home offices uh, with all the kind of beloved uh, stuff you know, around <laughs> us. Well, to begin with then, to dive in, I'd like to start with the question that I ask everybody, uh, before we get into the details of resilience and all that, um, this series is about cultivation. It's about internalizing and then drawing upon resources inside us, including our focus today, resilience. So if you could just start, uh, Steve, by giving us a sense for yourself personally, this is a question I ask everybody, mm -hmm. why has it been important for you personally to cultivate strengths inside yourself? Well, the, let's go back to really the construct of resilience and its linkage to both biology and behavior. And historically, uh, we're really talking about how well the uh, our systems can deal with challenges. So if you really ask, how does it deal with me personally, it's like I don't live in a vacuum. 
I live in a world that provides challenges and what you, one of the adaptive or resilient uh, uh, functions is that we want to enjoy our challenges because if we didn't have challenges, uh, there wouldn't be anything happening in our world. It was just kind of like we dissipate, we wouldn't grow, we wouldn't learn. So part of what we'll get into is this notion of resilience and neural exercises, actually uh, strengthening feedback loops. So I want to bring you back to uh, really early concepts of resilience, uh, really going back to the fathers of modern physiology like Claude Bernard, who was talking about internal milieu, which means the internal regulation of her body. Uh, and then that was uh, uh, basically a, a later by Walter Cannon in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, a, f a physiologist, actually a physician who studied psychology at Harvard with William James. So if you want to know all the history there. And he wrote a book called Wisdom of the Body. And he wrote in uh, papers in Psych Review and other psychology journals as well. And he talked about the whole notion of homeostasis. And so we can't talk about resilience without talking about homeostasis. And so the, and then finally, the, the next person I want to bring in to start this whole dialogue before we get back to the personal one is Norbert Wiener, who talked about cybernetics, which was really a, a word that he created about steering the ship. And what you start seeing is as these systems from internal milieu to homeostasis to cybernetics, we start getting more and more, in a sense, a cognitive model of how we can regulate our body. So we start really seeing the structure of a mind-body science coming, coming from these uh, luminaries of the past. And now if we go back to your personal question is um, the understanding that uh, our, we have bodies, we have nervous systems, and we have volitions. And how do we put this all together? So when we get challenged, how do we use our, our understanding of who we are to steer us like cybernetics, steer the ship, move the body into safe places? And what you'll start uh, hearing from me throughout, the under, throughout this dialogue, the underlying theme, is our goal in life is to be safe but not safe by ourselves, mm. safe with other people or other appropriate mammals. So, uh, but the issue is we're not, we didn't evolve to be singletons, to be alone. We evolved to be interactive and connected, connected. That's great. Yeah. Well, a little bit later on, um, um, you've given me permission to ask you a little more personal uh, details about how you yourself have cultivated resilience, mm. but maybe good place to start here is to get into the topic itself. So the word resilience, uh, as you very well know, is kind of a broad umbrella term. Mm -hmm. Lots of people um, sort of like a Christmas tree, hang different ornaments upon it, uh, self-regulation, self-control, bouncing back, uh, yeah. executive functions and so forth. Could you give us a short and sweet definition well, of uh, res resilience? That, that you know, I lean forward, I move. I, it's very dangerous to ask me a short and sweet <laughs> answer or question. But first of all, my strategy is always going to be understanding the neurophysiology underlying our body. So in a sense, thinking of a scaffolding model. So uh, if we don't understand our physiology, then the cues from our physiology become, dis we just don't understand them. And we are... Uh, higher order parts of our brain and nervous system, which happens to be very creative, will make interesting personal narratives. Mm -hmm. So as we become more and more informed about our bodily responses, we can make better narratives and better models of how we can regulate ourselves. So let's just play personally. Um, actually, I'll, 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 I understand where we want to go in part. So I want to, I'm going to move you back to... Uh, uh, the 13-year-old Steve, if you can do that, okay? You, Steve. Me, yeah. me, Steve, as 13, okay, many years ago. and I'm already then, thinking that you were adorable, personally. Well, yeah, that's true for well, me. Well, thank you. But the real issue is what I always like to say is everyone grew up in a dysfunctional family. You know, if you talk to anyone, they all grew up in dysfunctional families. But most of our friends and colleagues uh, have actually done very well, and they love their parents, they love their feelings. But what was going on in the 13-year-old Steve? How was he becoming resilient to deal with, uh, you know, things going on in the home, things going on in school, dealing things? And what I was doing, I was actually a, a clarinet player. I was a musician. And I was actually... Uh, uh, 
uh, practicing the clarinet, which resulted in lots of breathing, so slow exhalation, and you know where I'm going with this, uh, which is that I was actually practicing through playing the clarinet pranayama yoga. I was actually learning. Carmen, slow down. Right. For, sorry, Steve. For people, other people, pranayama is yoga breathing. Yeah. yeah. And the, but it's not just, okay, so that's what it is. But physiologically, it is as you have slow exhalations, you increase the vagal influence on the heart, and that calms you down. And that puts you into a state where you can think, you can, in a sense, access higher cognitive structures, higher brain structures. So actually slow breathing or slow exhalation, which is part of pranayama yoga, is also part of singing and is also part of playing wind instruments. And it's functionally a neural exercise of increasing this vagal regulation of the viscera, which is really one of the mechanisms for resilience. Okay. So, the, and, and the, the answer is, so if you look at people, and many of the people watching this will be clinicians uh, who, who deal with uh, uh, clients, and they will understand their clients by merely watching how they breathe. So people who have short phrases and are <laughs> gasping for air, they see it as anxious. But people who uh, exhale slowly, extend the duration of their phrases, lower the pitch of their voices, it's calming to both the listener and it's reflecting their own physiological state. So the 13-year-old Steve accidentally <laughs> learned all about the polyvagal theory and pranayama yoga by practicing his clarinet. And it's even more involved than you think because those of you who know anything about the polyvagal theory, it's the linkage of the facial muscles, the muscles of the stri striate muscles of the face and head with the vagal regulation of the heart. And what does playing the clarinet do? It creates an embouchure. It makes you listen, contract your middle ear muscles. It regulates the face and the breath. It's all integrated. Singing does the same. That's lovely. So, do so as a 13-year-old, yeah. as a 13-year-old, I was, in a sense, a, a student uh, 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 of, of something I didn't understand. But what it did, it provided a resource for me that enabled me to deal with many challenges in life. And so we all deal with challenges. And the other metaphor that I, I, I'm going to use is that everyone's hell is their own. So we can't evaluate the features of the challenge and say, oh, that's nothing. Well, you know, why don't you just take care of it? Because those features may be very specific to that individual's vulnerabilities. And so always if someone is telling you they're in hell or they're in life threat or things are really bad, you can't say to them, oh, that's nothing. You have to respect that. That's great. It's beautiful. Well, if we could, I, I want to slow it down a little bit and go back to kind of a clean, coherent definition of resilience. Mm -hmm. And then we'll move to that okay. keyword you dropped in a few times that may be unfamiliar to many people, vagal. So we'll get to the vagal part. But if we could just kind of establish, consolidate our gains here, uh, okay. what do you mean by resilience? What is resilience and why should people care about it? Okay, so what, what I'm, I'm operationalizing it in my thoughts as the ability... Uh, to stabilize herself after challenge. So it's basically building on Claude Bernard, building on Walter Cannon, and then utilizing Norbert Wiener. So in a sense, uh, where uh, Bernard talked about resilience of the internal viscera, so if you distorted the biochemistry, it, there is enough buffers, the system would come back. Uh, and then Cannon talked more in terms of neurochemical and sympathetic nervous system adjusting. And when you get into Norbert Wiener, you actually start seeing the linkage between software and hardware. So the issue is resilience is, for me, our ability to read our body reactions to the challenge because it's, the challenge isn't the issue. It's our reaction to the challenge. And then reading those body responses, being smart, meaning putting ourselves in safety or negotiating a way for us so that we can go back and recover our visceral states that are healthy for us. Now, we live in an environment, and many of us have been academics for long periods of time, which is chronic stress or chronic demand. And 
it's not an environment where you can navigate yourself into a space of safety and peace and feeling comfort because the model is you got to keep producing, keep doing this, keep doing that. And that's a meta uh, model. It's not an individual one. So the resilience is the ability to take challenge that is disruptive to your physiology, understand it, and then to be smart and to put your body into a safe place. All right. So just to pull out and mirror back to you, because of mm-hmm. course I'm a therapist, that's what I do, but mm-hmm. um, a couple of key points here. So we have person in some kind of equilibrium, and we're going to yeah. talk more about that. Yeah. Challenges, challenge arrives, there's a disturbance, and uh-huh. then there's some kind of adaptive response to the uh-huh. challenge yeah. that over time, in time measured in different intervals depending on the challenge in the person, there's some kind of restoration of a healthy equilibrium, right? I'm, not, I'm going to put something else on the table. I'm going to say that there are functionally neural exercises that will make us uh, deal with challenges better or make us more resilient. And that's part of what's missing in education. It's missing in even physical fitness. We forget that it's the feedback loops that bring us back to that uh, comfort state. Now, I missed one point in my early statements of homeostasis and uh, cybernetics and internal milieu. And that was the statement that most people misinterpret the concept of a steady state. Healthy steady states are not steady. They are oscillatory. They show great range. It's only when you get ill does your nervous system start to retract its range. Mm -hmm. So resilience is mirrored in how well our nervous system can take challenges. That's a beautiful way to summarize it. And I also want to uh, underscore what's been implicit and explicit as well in what you've said so far about the idea of multiple intertwining levels. There's a conceptual level. And there's a sensory level, there are emotional systems, there are drive systems, and volitions, mm-hmm. desires, intentions, and so forth. And they interact with each other. And the interaction is, you know, is complex. And that's not, in a sense, to buy out that we're not going to discuss it. It's the importance that things occurring in your body, in your viscera, can impact what's going on in your brain. That the bottom can go up just as well as the top can go down. And that these loops of feedback systems are intertwined. And remember, we've grown up in a world that said, below the neck is something that we can treat like an automobile. And if anything bothers you, it's all up in your head. Just just get rid of it. And that's not fair to the human process. The body is continually sending signals that are that are changing availability of different brain structures. Right. You know, thinking about your emphasis on uh, the internal milieu, the the internal state of the body, Mm -hmm. including down in the deep, deep organs, the viscera. Uh, You're reminding me of a, uh, speaking of how people treat their bodies, sometimes I think they treat them like this old plow horse. And (laughs) my dad was born on a ranch in uh, North Dakota Mm -hmm. in 1918. Um, became a school teacher, then eventually a zoologist, and he had a wow. saying from his from his upbringing about horses that sometimes people feel not just academics, as you well know, but mm-hmm. people in all kinds of situations and work life, raising children, and all the rest. Sometimes people feel like they're a horse that's been quote rid hard and put up wet, <laughs> <laughs> rid hard and put up wet. <laughs> well, let me put my my other metaphor, um, and that was that. Uh, moving into emeritus status, uh, uh, my metaphor was, I, I'll give you the bit, I said 42 years in prison, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the issue is, it's not that I didn't like uh, being an academic or don't like being, because I still am. Yeah. It's that the constraints are like being rid hard. Yeah. And what you want to do is still have enough in you, enough resilience, so that when you get out of prison or you get out of the constraints, you can recover and then do the things that are most interesting and important to you, like, you know, trying to translate ideas into practice. That's great. And that word recover, again, a key word to flag here, uh, recover from challenge and so forth. Well, as we move soon into talking about polyvagal theory itself, I wonder if we could create, um, first of all, uh, a a foundation by talking about the autonomic nervous system. If you could educate us a little bit about the autonomic nervous system, then that'll 
help us move into polyvagal theory okay. itself. Okay. The autonomic nervous system uh, historically has been viewed as the nervous system that was below awareness that regulate all our internal organs. Uh, that, that was the historical view. The other historical view of it was that we really have two subcomponents of the autonomic nervous system. A sympathetic nervous system, which everyone thinks of in terms of mobilization and fight-flight responses. And we have a parasympathetic nervous system, a system of health, growth, and restoration. And that was the end of the story. Uh, in fact, when the concept of the autonomic nervous system was concretized in the early 1900s, it was thought of a, as only a motor system affecting visceral organs. The sensory part was written out. They didn't even include it. And the regulation component in the brain was, in, was not even included. And that's why physicians who have learned this model think that, oh, this is... Uh, your heart or this is your gut. It shouldn't have anything to do with your brain. If they had been educated in the 1800s, they would have seen that the connection between the viscera and the brain was great and it was going through a nerve that was known then as the pneumogastric, which is the vagus. So the vagus is a thick trunk nerve that comes out of our brainstem and then goes all over our, our viscera. But 80% of those fibers are sensory. They're receiving inputs. They're right. not sending motor signals. Right, right, right. And we tend to be locked into that motor bit. What the polyvagal theory did uh, was look at the phylogeny, the evolutionary changes in how the autonomic nervous system functioned. And what it identified was that there were two different vagal circuits. And one was a defense one. Okay, so one was a very ancient one found in reptiles and older vertebrates that basically shut the organism down. So like a turtle immobilizes or a reptile, their defenses is immobilization. They stop breathing, their heart rates get lower, metabolic demands are forgotten or disappeared. But that made the story about parasympathetic in vagus, and vagus is a major part of our parasympathetic nervous system. It made that story of it being part of health, growth, and restoration. It just didn't fit, so no one told that story. They told the story of the sympathetic as your defense system. So the polyvagal theory would reintroduce to the world the idea that we had two defense systems, and one defense system was vagal. Can you say more what you mean by the word defense and maybe link that to coping and challenge and resilience? It is truly defense. So it means that if something uh, is, well, the, for a mammal, this old vagal circuit is how we respond to life threat. Uh, it's, it's the example of people who pass out or people who physically can't move when they're being abused or being uh, challenged or people who dissociate. Dissociation is part of that, that uh, complex syndrome. And so what the polyvagal theory provides is an understanding of the body's adaptive function to profound challenges associated with life threat. It is not a cognitive decision. The shutting down, the passing out, the defecation with fear is not a voluntary one. So when, when a mouse is in the jaw of a cat and it passes out, the mouse isn't doing this voluntarily. It's not saying, hey, it's a good idea if I pass out. The, ma the cat won't find any uh, need for me. And in fact, with significant percentages of those mice, they drop dead. Uh, and so we mammals still have this. And many of the people who uh, suffer from a severe trauma will report symptoms very similar. And, and this is really the, the major interesting part of the polyvagal theory. So I outlined all these uh, sequences about how humans and mammals would respond. So uh, if they're safe, they'll utilize their social engagement system, which is the facial muscles, and that's linked to prosodic vocalizations. And you can hear voice clearly, you can see facial expression, and that's linked to this myelinate or new mammalian vagus, which calms us. But it not only calms us, it allows that sympathetic and the older vagus to do their homeostatic jobs. Okay, so Steve, yeah. you live in this world, and <laughs> I've had a lot of experience with it as well. But one thing I've come to appreciate is that this is, to underline the word poly, it's yeah. a complex theory. And it really helps to unpack the pieces of it, if okay. we could. So um, if you'll uh, 
put up with me doing this a little bit. So we have we have this general idea of equilibrium, which involves change within a healthy range yeah. around a healthy set point. The equilibrium is at many, many levels with mm -hmm. feedback loops going all through yeah. it in the body-mind complex, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, resilience is about recovery from challenge back to a healthy range and so forth. Good. And then we have these, the nervous system very involved in this process of regulation, mm -hmm. a wing of this nervous system being the autonomic wing of the nervous system that is somewhat regula is regulatory and quite automatic and yet is available to conscious intervention and control yeah. to some extent. Great. And then we have the vagus nerve. And we have so the evolution of the nervous system over mm -hmm. 600 million years, mm -hmm. loosely in its sort of brainstem, subcortical, yeah. cortical stages. And then we have the vagus nerve complex, this very um, mm. complicated complex yeah. that uh, has two branches, essentially. The first one being very associated with the reptilian or brainstem, really, phase of evolution, uh, and the parasympathetic wing of the nervous system, yeah. which under extreme cases, uh, as a response to a threat, as you put it, a defense system, the parasympathetic nervous system that's quite involved in things like exhaling while playing the clarinet mm -hmm. or, ha, ah, you know, just kind yeah. of relaxing and mellow out, can, under extreme conditions, initiate a freeze response that oh. helps animals survive but can go to extremes that are problematic. Oh. Okay, no, take let, it from let, here. Okay, let, let's separate for a moment. Good. All right. <laughs> okay, let's separate for a moment because let's the, – the old parasympathetic, the old vagus is – primarily subdiaphragmatic. It's going to the organs below your diaphragm. This is totally out of your conscious realm of thought. You can't control it by thinking. You can't regulate it. And this is a profound system. This is really where Claude Bernard was really working on. Okay. What's it do down in those organs? Oh. Well, it... it it uh, helps metabolize and get, you know, it, it digests. It's the gut. It's important. I mean, it's it's profound. And this is the area. Now, if you start talking about your trauma victims and their difficulty, many of them are dealing with abdominal disorders. And what are some of the symptoms? Abdominal problems, uh, digestive problems, uh, and the whole issue of the linkage with the pelvic floor, which is also another area which I'm just learning about after having surgery. So this whole issue of uh, a lot of the symptoms that people have, whether it's childbirth or other surgeries, that impact on the pelvic floor and the pelvic floor infecting on your your uh, digestive process, on your bladder, and all these other symptoms that people are coming into therapy with, is all being regulated in part by that old reptilian subdiaphragmatic vagus, that unmyelinated old vagus. It's I mean, part Steve, of your... Say what myelination is. Yeah. Myelination is literally a fatty substance coating the nerve. That in, It's like a coaxial cable. It makes it travel more efficiently, faster, uh, with greater specificity. So it's a, a more evolved or, quote, smarter neural circuit, if we want to attribute uh, causality to it. But this subdiaphragmatic issue is really all about health, growth, and restoration. That was that old vagus. The new vagus, the vagus that I recruited while playing the clarinet, was not the old vagus. It was the, the new vagus. And the new vagus it was the, uh, is a myelinated one. So the, the new vagus is the myelinate one that we've described, but that has a degree of voluntary control since its brainstem area is linked to the muscles of the face and head and linked to breath. So we can, in a sense, recruit that system. And once we recruit that system, it enables that old vagal circuit to do its homeostatic job. It enables the sympathetics to be part of the homeostatic one. So our goal in life is to take away are to, to minimize our autonomic nervous system from reacting in defensive, in defensive modes because it has two defensive modes, either to mobilize and stimulate the sympathetics. When it does that, it turns off the function of the subdiaphragmatic. And listen, your mother was right when she told you not to go swimming after eating because swimming is getting the sympathetics going and interfering with the subdiaphragmatic digestive process. Oh, okay? Yeah. And if mobilization doesn't get us into a safe place, 
then our body may adaptively go into immobilization and shut down and pass out. And that's that old vagus. Okay, so and, now could yeah. you kind of so now we have the old vagus, right? Yeah. Which uh, is basically largely out of conscious control. It's unmyelinated. It lacks yeah. that insulation around the fibers. It's pretty basic. Okay. Yeah. And then somewhere along the six hundred million year path of the evolution of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Somewhere there, and maybe you could take us back in the time machine, the uh, second branch, as it were, uh, uh, of the vagus uh, nerve complex developed linked to mammalian evolution. Could you okay. kind of take us now yeah. to the second I branch? I, I can't give you the exact year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah for <laughs> sure. Give or take a couple 50 million year um, intervals. I, I tried to figure this one out, but they're really talking somewhere 150 to 200 million years ago. But I, I don't like using time as the landmarks. I'd rather use the transition from reptiles to mammals. Right. And I think there's so much we can learn about human behavior and human vulnerabilities by focusing in on the things that change from mammals to from reptiles to mammals. Now, our reptilian common relative was something like a tortoise. <laughs> and so it wasn't a snake and it wasn't an alligator. It was something like a tortoise. So now think for a moment, what is a tortoise's defense system? Shutting down. And what happens to a tortoise? when they go underwater, which they do do. Now, do tortoises breathe underwater? That's a trick question. No, they don't. But what they do, since they have small brains, is they don't need much oxygen. They can stay under for long periods of time. So mammals still have a similar defensive system of shutting down, lowering their heart rate, and literally stopping breathing or lowering the degree that they're breathing. But mammals need oxygen. And so Recruiting that one is potentially lethal. Now, the other thing that occurs... So, so what do you mean? Yeah. Recruit, you mean like breathing underwater could be potentially lethal? No. That's what you mean? Slowing, no? slowing their heart rate and not breathing is potentially okay, lethal. Okay, that's what you mean. Going too far with right. that old right. vagal response. Right, right. It's like uh, yeah, saying... Like a mouse died. that drops dead inside right. the mouth of the cat. And there's the possibility, of course, of people dying of fear. They talk about that. Or people defecating in fear. So defecation in fear is that same system. Or people passing out in fear, it's the same system. So passing out is the same neural circuit as defecation and uh, slowing up. Okay, so that, that is that old defensive system. And the question really is, how do we keep ourselves out of it? And you can't get into it. Now, here's from a clinician's point of view. You'll love this. You can't shut down if you keep moving. So guess what? A lot of people who have had shut down type of experiences are uh, uh, express it as anxiety. So they're mobilized. They it won't sit still. They don't trust anyone. They're moving. They're jittery because their body, the signals from their body are that if they, if they sit still, they're going to be vulnerable and they're going to fall into that system. And what we want to do is get this newer circuit, this newer mammalian vagal circuit that enables us to cue other that we're safe through our voice and calm us down and send cues to the other person. Uh, let me insert one other construct. And the other construct that is... Uh, intricately involved in the polyvagal theory is this construct of neuroception, which is the nervous system's evaluation of risk in the environment and in other outside the realm of awareness. So it's not perception. We can't move it into that realm. Our body reacts, and our body reacts to features like the prosodic features of voice. So we Prosodic have... being intonation. Right. So... so Rick, if we met and I talked like a, a traditional academic at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, there'd be no dialogue uh, because the voice would be very monotonic and perhaps too loud without much articulation. And pretty soon you turn off as well as everyone else who would be watching because our body is picking up the features of intonation of voice, prosodic features. And it's triggering our physiology to calm down. Now, mothers have known this. 
and virtually other mammals. So if you talk to, you have a, you have a cat, you told me, but dogs are really exquisitely sensitive. So if you talk to a dog in a monotone, they'll go down to the floor as submissive because they see it as aggressive. But if you talk with a sing-songy voice, they're at home, they're comfortable because they have the same structures and the same mechanisms that we have. So our nervous system is picking up intonation. So master clinicians know this. They know how to make people feel safe. So, Steve, if if we could, this is great. So just help us um, walk us through the transition from the first uh, branch of the vagus nerve to the second branch and this movement from tortoise uh, onward. And what were the adaptive functions of this second branch? Why did... uh, why did it evolve over time? Well, you know, we can only tell a story, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, it, you know, I, because we're, we're trying to put pieces together. And the story that I like to tell is that mammals, due to their metabolic demands, you know, they have bigger brains, they have to move, they need to create safe environments because they need to sleep, they need safe places to defecate, they need, in a sense, a structure, whether it's a nest or something, and they also need, uh, what, mammals needed a mother, so they, they had to, it's not like reptiles, reptiles don't need mothers, they, they just, when I say the reptiles, reptiles from whom mammals evolved, now crocodiles uh, actually broke off uh, are not related to us, and they do a little bit of mothering. So let me, you know, there are people who are going to be watching think they got me. No, it's <laughs> we have to know our own phylogenetic history. Our phylogenetic history is through the turtle. And turtles do not mother their young. They lay the eggs, they go away, and then the other ones survive. But, but mammals need to mother. So safety to mother, to give birth, to defecate, to reproduce, required signaling. And the signaling, in my worldview, was the notion is that the vocalizations had to convey to the other mammal that they were safe. And that's where the prosody goes. Because prosodic features are actually being driven in part by a branch of the vagus. So the intonation of our voice is conveying the physiological state. And now I'm going to do a real... Uh, strange shift because I'm going to tell you briefly that we're doing this research with human babies and with baby vo- with human vo- not with human with adult voles which are the prairie vole. And my wife is Sue Carter who studied oxy actually discovered the important relationship between oxytocin and social behavior and we started collaborating putting heart rate uh, monitors in these voles 50 gram animals but we also started to listen to their ultrasonic vocalizations. And basically, their ultrasonic vocalizations, if they're prosodic, tell you that the heart rate is slower. So what they're doing in this mammal is that they're conveying to another mammal that you're safe to come close to. If your heart rate is slower, you're safer because you're not going to be coming close to another mammal or or conspecific who's going to be mobilized and aggressive. So the issue is... Wearing your heart on your face or in your voice had powerful adaptive functions in enabling mammals to seek out and to find who was safe to be with. All right. Let me say back to you, if I could, Steve, um, a uh, formulation I've heard of your polyvagal theory and uh, see if you can fine tune it for us. Okay. Okay. So the formulation I've, a formulation that I've heard takes these two branches of the polyvagal complex, um, one of the most recent of which especially moves up into the face and really helps govern the enormously expressive mammalian and especially primate and human mm-hmm. face and vocal intonation. It also has some regulation of the inner ear, so we, can't, we don't just transmit subtleties of up and yeah. down, but we can actually comprehend them, we can receive mm-hmm. them as well. Mm-hmm. So we have the second branch, and there's a kind of coupling between the social engagement system that's mm-hmm. very relational mm-hmm. and um, uh, regulation of the heart and yeah. lungs of the, mm-hmm. the viscera, including the regulation of the sympathetic mm-hmm. wing of the autonomic nervous system, which can tend to move into fleeing or aggression, mm-hmm. so that this second more recent branch draws upon social engagement, mm-hmm. uh, interactions, and also internal processing. 
to help regulate this active fight or flight sympathetic branch so that we can actually tolerate each other and mm -hmm. sustain relationships within mm -hmm. a healthy range, going back mm -hmm. to your idea of equilibrium and homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So that's, could you, what do you I, think I'm, of that I'll formulation? Fine I'll fine tune it a little bit, yeah. okay. Um, if you are, quote, resilient and have a well-developed myelinate vagal regulatory system, then you can move your body in space and time without recruiting the sympathetic nervous system. You do that by merely trans, uh, a transitory retraction of what I call the vagal break. But if you're out of shape and you get older and you're just, you know, you're a high sympathetic stressed out person, the vagal system is weak or at least not recruited and in a sense the fuse or the trigger to, the, to, to blow up is very, very uh, easily uh, uh, expressed. So the idea, this gets back to the whole notion of resilience, and where I like to go with this is this whole notion of neural exercising. And the neural exercises are really of the social engagement system. Mm -hmm. And the social engagement system not only has the behavioral part that you beautifully described, but has a visceral motor through this myelinate vagus. And, and that's our ability, and this is the beauty of it, it's our ability to utilize social interactions to change our physiology. So the, the metaphor would be is the nervous system of social engagement and social support is the nervous system of health, growth, and restoration. Because when that nervous system is working well, it enables the sympathetic and that old vagus, that old parasympathetic, to do the homeostatic functions that it needs to do. So we can never say the sympathetic is bad. We need our sympathetic nervous system. And we can't say that the old vagus is bad. We really need that. And so the systems need to function, and they need to function in their, in their homeostatic dance, but they can only do that if we're in safe interactions. So it's a hierarchical system, and because humans are mammals, the social engagement and the linkage with calming us down is the only way that our body will function in its appropriate homeostatic way. Okay. So if you could go back to that phrase you used, vagal break. Yeah. And um, if you could maybe even walk us through a concrete example, uh, perhaps, you know, okay. hypothetical with your wife, where you're with someone, you're excited, you're interactive, it's, it's good, okay. and you're not tipping into sympathetic arousal. I, I'll, I'll give you the great ones. Your father, right? I am a father. Yeah, I have two kids. Yeah. Uh, t tell me, how did you feel when you were left with the children? You mean the very first time? Uh, well, I mean, when they were young, let's say they were infants and your, your wife wants to go somewhere, how did you feel? Oh, the very first time, I felt like time, the very first occasion, I felt like time slowed down and I was just watching the second hand move on the clock, waiting mm -hmm. for my wife to come back, you know, oh. uh, quickly. Uh, with a little practice, though, I, I actually was very involved as a father with my young it's, kids. It's not the question of involvement. It was, okay, so... How did I me, feel? Oh, I felt great, generally. I felt okay. really I'm, loving. I'm, 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 I felt I'm, great. Give, no, you see, you're, 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 you're getting too transparent. So I'm going to really push the window here. All right. So Turn I, the tables I, on me. Go for it. Okay, so I shared with you this notion of what I call the countdown timer. So if my wife left, it was functionally a countdown timer until she came back. Right. But, but my wife was an academic and a professional, and she would go to Europe or go away for a few days. And, I mean, that was my life. Was, my life was to take care of the kids. Now, of course, I had love and concern. It wasn't until she actually did a study with the Vol. And Vol fathers father a lot. So they take care of the little pups. And we had telemetry in the little vagal uh, uh, fathers. What happens is that they maintain their vagal inhibition on their heart, but their sympathetics also go up high. So they actually have, in a sense, a dual innervation because they now have to be hyper vigilant. They got to do pup retrieval, but they also are highly vagal, so they're not aggressive. If they lose their vagal tone, they attack the pup. Vagal tone being. Inhibitory, in effect. If they lose calming. the inhibitory control, if they lose the break, they the rev break. up and they attack the pup. Yeah, they attack the pup, even though their heart rates, when the vagal break is on, is relatively elevated because they also have the sympathetic going. So it's exactly how I felt. 
So I felt this hypervigilance as protection, but also this nurturing and trying to, you know, take care of them. You got the best and, of both worlds. Right. But it, you need the neural resilience. So now let's go into this whole world of child abuse, especially by non-biological fathers, which is really quite common. And this is the noise and the irritability of the infant can trigger this reactivity. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a biology to this. And so the vagal break is merely, it's a metaphor, but it's also measurable. So it's measurable, the vagal influence through this new myelinate vagus or the vagal break can be measured by the oscillations in heart rate. What that means is that the heart rate goes up and down with respiratory activity. And the degree it goes up and down with respiratory activity is an indicator of that vagal break. And the reason it goes up and down with respiratory activity is that neurophysiologically, respiration is literally gating on and off the vagal affect, the vagal, if, vagal motor influence on the, on the sinal atrial node, on the pacemaker. So slow that down for us. When you talk about inhaling affecting the heart rate and exhaling affecting the heart rate. So when you normally, you know, this, the, you know when you inhale, the vagal activity through this newer vagus to the heart's pacemaker, it's taken away. It goes away, and your heart rate goes faster. And when you exhale... Take off the brakes when you inhale, the heart speeds yeah, up. right. So what do you tell people to do to calm down? You say, take a deep breath and exhale slowly. And what are you doing? You're putting on the vagal brake. And what did the 13-year-old Steve do when he played the clarinet? He took a deep breath. But he exhaled for close to two minutes, okay, blowing constantly with all the other parts of the social engagement system firing synchronously. So he was building that neural resilience. And good clinicians are doing the same thing. They're listening and they're articulating. Now, let, let me shift this a little bit, about 45 degrees. Um, it's the middle ear muscles that change our ability to hear human voice and to dampen background sounds. So if you're scared and mobilized, do you want to hear human voice or do you want to hear the sounds of predator? What's more adaptive for you? The sounds of predator. And so we look at people who have uh, basically trauma and abuse histories and we look at their upper part of their face and they show no affect, if you notice a lot of them. And that tells you the, uh, this uh, orbital muscle around the eye carries a lot of cues but it also is an indicator of whether their middle ear muscles are working because a branch of the nerve that controls the orbital muscle controls the middle ear muscles as well. So when people are expressive and they're looking at you like you are, they're actually hearing the words that you're saying. Now, if you yell at someone, what happens to their face? Right. And what happens? Do they hear what you're saying? They don't hear, not a word. Yeah. So this is something that's missing in our understanding of developing children and in education, that cues of safety bring, uh, increase the ability to process language. Right. Well, let's, this is great, Steve, and let's use this, if we could, as our segue into uh, the kind of practical applications or mm -hmm. in, in some of them and implications of what we've said. I think we have a good foundation here, and um, I we truly do. Okay. Um, thinking about this for a moment, maybe what we could talk about are ways to use mm -hmm. social engagement experiences, both actual and imagined, if you'll mm -hmm. play around with that a little bit. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, is how we can. So let's suppose that a person, I'll give you two kinds of examples. Okay, let's suppose a person is, you know, in the kind of typical range of functioning. They're sort of stressed, they're, a little fr they're pretty frazzled and uh, kind of rattled going through life. And their personal stressometer, their stressometer, you know, is kind of locked on yellow, if not stably in orange. And it's not good. Mm -hmm. they, they want some help. Or, second example, someone who's truly had pretty impactful, painful life experiences, even to the scale of them being traumatic. So in either case, how could people use social experiences, actual and imagined, mm -hmm. to help themselves? Okay. Okay. The the human uh, nervous system is really quite miraculous. It's really wonderful because we can functionally use visual images or, or memories and change our own physiology. 
Uh, and, you know, this is part of uh, uh, how you would prepare for surgery. You would, in a sense, try to have positive visual images so that your body doesn't tense up and so you literally fight any type of intervention. That would be a medical model. Now, on the psychological clinical thing, knowledge of this would say, one thing that I want to do in terms of my clinical setting is to make sure that there's no low-frequency sounds. Uh, because low frequency sounds will, to the nervous system, trigger defensiveness. Yeah. That uh, sort of it, ominous background sound in horror films or Jaws, you it's, know, it's, it's shark even, coming. It's even worse. So yeah. to your left, I see an air conditioner. That air conditioner has a lot of low frequency sounds. It's off happily. I, I know. I, I would have heard it, but the issue is uh, it creates enough background noise for some people that it makes them irritated. They can't process. Now, quiet space enables people who do not have good neural regulation of their middle ear structures to start to listen to other people's voices. So they, the prosodic features could get into their brain and come back down and help regulate the middle ear muscles. Now, we developed an intervention in which we took vocal music and we computer altered it so that it modulated the frequencies and put it on and gave it to uh, kids who were autistic with auditory hypersensitivities and had amazing effects in terms of their ability to process language and also increase their vagal regulation of the heart. Can, so, can people get access to this? I mean, immediately, yeah. I'm, trust me, yeah. I'm going to get a lot of emails to say, how do I get this for my kid? Uh, oh, the intervention is only um, being given in my laboratory, and I'm doing a feasibility study in Australia this year. And if that works out fine, we'll have it elsewhere. But the, the, the metaphor is really a neural exercise. And what we can do, rather than say, get the intervention for my kid, we can say, what are the rules or what are the lessons that I learned from the research? And lessons were, if you, have, if you can control the acoustic environment and provide modulated frequencies in prosodic range, basically yeah. amplified prosody, then the physiology shifts and then you start getting spontaneous social behavior in children who were like this, you know, looking away. Because the, what they're doing, and this is another metaphor, another way of viewing it, many clinical disorders share common features, auditory hypersensitivities, poor eye gaze, gaze aversion, uh, flatness of the neural tone to the upper face, uh, the way they speak would be loud or monotonic, and their physiology is pretty uh, you know, uh, sympathetic-like, defensive, or they're even like this. Some of them are walking around like this half the time. And so they're telling you what their physiological state is. Now, the clinical perspective is how do I get the physiological state calmed down? Because the model really is that we're on a scaffolding system. We can't access some of these wonderful social features unless we can calm the system down. But we evolve certain what I call feature detectors. And the feature detectors are very intuitive because every parent and every successful therapist knows this. It's how you engage another person. It's how you use your voice. It's how you use gesture. And right. if you don't, if you start saying it's all in the words, you lose everyone. So it's what I often love to say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Right. Uh, Maya Angelou, I think, has this quote. She says, people will forget uh, what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Yeah, well, that's it. That is perfect. You know, because that is, you're triggering the neuroception of other people. And that's what this is all about. So, Steve, if we could, let's go back to that first example. Uh, so I'm frazzled. I'm going through life. Yep. I'm just dealing with life. I'm busy. You mm -hmm. know, I'm, and I want to... Um, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a worrier, let's say. I can feel like my fuse is a little shorter than I want it to be. Nothing clinical, just everyday life. Uh, and I want to feel happier altogether and, um, you know, grow personally. Okay, mm -hmm. how could I use this complicated polyvagal theory stuff in really down-to-earth ways okay. in everyday life? What could I okay. do differently? I, I'm going to tell you it's so intuitive that you, you already know the answers that the first thing is you got to look at the environment you're in and respect the fact that our body evolved to detect predator. 
So, and when we're young and quote resilient, it doesn't really matter because our nervous system is so efficient, it will knock out those low frequency sounds and we can engage people, we can go to bars and we can meet people. But as we get older, the system isn't as efficient. So the first thing is we need to, in a sense, understand what our body responds to. I'm going to take you on a little side tour for a moment. How old are your children? Uh, 25 and 23. Boys or girls? Uh, older son, younger daughter. Okay. So here's the question. What did either one of them do to your car radio when they were teenagers? Turned it up, oh, locked okay. it onto their favorite station. Okay. okay. They turned it up, but they did one thing else. What was that? Did they deal with the bass? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I think they were kind of oblivious to that part. Oh, but but most most parents will talk about their kids turning, cranking the bass up. Yeah, the low so, frequency sounds. Yeah, the low frequency sound. Now, here's the what they were performing for you was a psychophysics experiment. They want because when they attended to the vocal track, their middle ear muscles contracted, and most of the bass sounds reflected out of their ears, not into their ears. But you, being this doting and concerned parent in a state of fear and you know concern, like we all are, our middle ear muscles had long lost their neural tone, and we're bombarded with low frequency sounds, and we can't even hear human voice when it starts doing. So that is one of the most uh, dynamically perfect examples that we could pick. And it's really interesting to watch because if you to the if it's the voice track that they're attending to, and wham, the ears contract. Now, to measure that, I will also tell you that in speech and hearing sciences, no one thought that the ears were dynamic. They started talking that it's only a reflex, that the muscles. So we had to invent a, a device to measure middle ear transfer function. We got a patent on this. So the issue is what happens when, when people are, are, have these hypersensitivities and when they get older and when they have language disorders, the transfer function, meaning what sounds get into the inner ear and then up to your brain, are different uh, in people with uh, who have auditory hypersensitivities. So what happens is that the higher frequency components of sounds, where human voices, the meaning of words, the consonants, the ends of words, are lost. So people start misunderstanding what people are saying or only hear it as being yelled at. Right. So, okay. So um, here I am. I'm this kind of normal range, somewhat stressed, somewhat worried, little irritable person, how can I use my uh, uh, relationship experiences? You know, I have friends, I work with people, they're nice to me a lot of the time, it's not perfect, but they're pretty okay. Um, I also, I feel my own lovingness inside me, my own kindness and compassion and friendliness for others. All right, so this is happening for me as I go through life. How can I draw upon these social engagement experiences um, to uh, help myself, knowing what you know now about the architecture of the nervous system? Okay, so actually in your notes to discuss things, you said, what would one thing I would tell people? Is this the question? No, <laughs> we're, we're going to get there soon, but I'm just still I'm kind of in an everyday way, although, although it could be your one thing. It's just it's fine my if one it is. thing, and that is feel safe in the arms of another. So the issue is, I was going to say feel safe in the arms of another appropriate mammal, but uh, that gave you more flexibility. But the idea is the use of another person or even a dog. People often have these very strong relationships to their dogs or even their horses in which their bodies change once they embrace or come close to. And so we have to understand that we become more when we are able to feel vulnerable and safe in the arms of, and I don't even want the word vulnerable because we feel, we don't have that vulnerability. We're, we're ready to hug. Now remember that when you, uh, hug, you're showing your ventral side, which your, again is phylogenetically your always lower been. frontal side. Yeah. Front. Rather than right. dorsal, like the fin of a shark, right? The front. Or yeah. li like the shell of a turtle. Nice. <laughs> the lower belly, the soft underbelly. Yeah. Right, right. So we carry all these feelings. Right. And what I'm saying is with a scaffolding hierarchical model, we can inform ourselves by an understanding of our biology. And our biology is to be human, we have to feel safe. And I think that's the most powerful thing. And that's what I think what the polyvagal theory is all about. It's giving not just clinicians, but everyone the clues about understanding their body feedback 
so they can manage a world for them in which they will feel safe. Right. What has struck me about this is the circular process here, the two-way street. In other words, um, feeling safe or safer uh, mm -hmm. uh, helps us be more available for relationship and more skillful in relationship. Yeah. And also the internalization of the sense of relationship helps us feel safer over time. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, there are lots of there, there, there are multiple inputs uh, or factors for feeling safe, including an internal sense of strength or that one has the capacity to cope that um, don't necessarily depend entirely upon relationship experiences altogether. Mm -hmm. You know, So there's hope for us. There's hope for people who haven't had uh, super great relationship experiences. They can start by building up some internalized sense of strength and coping capacity, well, I, I, which I then, think which then a... can help them be more relational, which then can ah, help them be safer. See, so what do you think? I think it's an optimistic story, and I'm, and I'm on board. And this is really what I'm saying is when we understand that the portal through the intervention may merely be as simple as understanding what triggers physiological state, and then to try to phys trigger physiological state, which is going to make us uh, uh, more available interpersonally, but also we would go further. Inter it's not just interpersonally, it's spiritually, it's appreciating aesthetics, it's creativity. It's access to different areas of our brain which are shut down because we're in mobilization. So I think it's extraordinarily optimistic in a positive sense. I agree. And I think as I started off this whole dialogue, we all come from dysfunctional families. We all can create arguments that, you know, it's lucky that we're even functioning. The point is that the experiences, you know, we're a complex species that is extraordinarily adaptive. We are very adaptive. And what we need to learn is how proud we should be of our adaptive responses, even if they may have resulted in it shutting us down. They were powerful in the fact that they helped us survive. And rather than blame or feel victim, we should fear hero and that we have survived these things. Well, that's great. I mean, when you were, you've got about 10 or so more minutes, so we're moving kind of toward the end, and, and I'm really uh, looking forward to getting a few more kind of questions in here and building on your word, of neural exercises, when you talk about the possibilities being optimistic, of course, you don't mean optimistic like, eh, pie in the sky. You mean like, hey, it's very hopeful that through neural yeah. training and the plasticity of the nervous system, the way it's shaped by our experiences, that we can use our experiences here and now skillfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I think of as the most important minute of the life, one's life, the next minute, you know, minute after minute, right? So... Building on that, this notion of neural exercises, uh, you're a parent yourself. I can see some children over your shoulder there in the background. Um, they're they're are, much older now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are some ways, um, kind of succinctly, that parents can um, encourage, cultivate, nurture resilience in their children? Okay. So this goes back to the most, you know, I started talking about playing the clarinet. But even on the simplest level, Listening and talking in, in a reciprocal way is a neural exercise. Face-to-face -face interactions, social interactions, those are neural exercises. Yeah. Texting is not a neural exercise, okay? <laughs> these, are, these are issues that we really have to uh, develop a degree of uh, providing compensatory face-to-face -face interactions. And the reason is our nervous system needs reciprocal synchronous interactions. That's how we get our, our neural exercise. So neural exercise is our, even our interaction on Skype is a neural exercise for both of us. Listening, if we love certain types of music and we put ourselves in a place where we don't have to be hypervigilant, it's a neural exercise. Talking is a neural exercise. Um, what we have, it, it, so when I developed this listening project that I was talking about, to me it is functionally an efficient neural exercise of how listening feeds back and changes middle ear function and tries to also attempt to change physiological state. Right, but so, also, yeah, go on, sorry. Go on. Oh well, so you're saying parents can yeah. just cultivate resilience in their children in very natural and informal ways by you know communicating face to face, heart to heart. You know, yeah. ear to ear, if you will. Yeah. Um, additionally, any other ways? Well, or let's stick ways? with that for a moment because okay. there's an elaboration. With many challenged children, they're scared of their fathers, scared of their father's voices because they're lower pitch 
They're louder and less prosodic. And so rather than, and, and the fathers feel very awkward and, and horrible. And this is a lot within, you know, children who are on spectrum. But the issues are being more autistic, Asperger's or yes, autistic. Yeah. yeah. But it also overlaps with other, if we went into the abuse population or the, some of the adopted from Eastern Europe, some of the, the same types of overlap of symptoms. And so this is a scenario in which the father's not doing anything wrong. Nothing it's just wrong. the fact that he has a certain kind of a voice or... Yeah, or he, kind of- and he feels victimized because he really loves and wants to give to the child and the child's frightened of him. Now, he could talk in a higher pitched voice and, and you know and it would work, but what i 'm saying is uh motherese where mothers talk in a higher pitch and melodic sing songy or uh nurse uh, uh lullabies these you 're referring all- to the kind of universal language of mothers yeah. across culture so called motherese right. you know hi baby you know yeah. in any language go well, on. do it, yeah. do it with your cat or do it with your dog you 'll get the same effect. <laughs> Because their neuroception... Can you do it with your wife of 31 years and get the uh, same benefit? You can try. They stopped listening. Uh, 31, I'd say oh. they stopped listening 10 years ago. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I can't, I'm not allowed to tell you because I've yeah. been married, but it's it's more than 31. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's always interesting. <laughs> but the, so the Trust me, it's a two-way street. I've listened to a lot of women talk about their partners. Yeah. But uh, the notion is prosodic voices... Uh, basically take people, almost get them off guard. And this is, you know, uh, there, there are people who have, you know, utilized this to great advantage. I, I, I'm going to mention like Bill Clinton used to bring the Republicans over to the White House and they would leave feeling happy, but they didn't know what they had agreed to. They basically <laughs> got into feeling good. And that was because he had a hyper extension of the range of vocalizations. And he used it and was very effective. Um, George Bush didn't have that gift. And so, in fact, if you listen to George Bush's uh, speeches, he's using much more of a volume modulation. You mean the second George Bush? That's the one you're referring to? The second George Bush. The first one wasn't great either on these features. But the second one, in terms of the, didn't use uh, frequency modulation in his voice. He used loudness. Uh, So you you felt that he was yelling or barking at you. uh, And, And so the issue really is, uh, going back to uh, what parents can do and what partners can do is understand the power of prostatic features in triggering. And they can understand the power of being in environments with low frequency sounds. So if you're having a difficult relationship, you don't go to a noisy bar. You just don't do that because you're to going talk to talk with your partner. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You just don't. Or. Uh, a former cl- uh, colleague and very close friend, you might know him, John Gottman. Do you know John? John did a study which he never published. He had couples on treadmills, and he was dealing with marriage couples, and so they're getting their heart rate up, yeah. and they couldn't resolve any of their arguments while on the treadmill. I want him to publish that study so that I could use it. <laughs> but the point was they had manipulated physiological state to a state that was made social dialogue Unavailable. They they could speak, but they were just too revved up. That's right. Um, okay, so two more questions then, kind of the the, the last two. Uh, you've been willing to be a little personal here, so uh, this is a question I ask everyone. Uh, in terms of the general idea of cultivation and um, growing good stuff inside ourselves, uh, what are you working on these days? Uh, what are you cultivating? Maybe you've had some challenges recently or... Just in general, um, cultivating something. What's your edge? Oh, the the edge goes like this. What happens if you don't have to do work for others? Okay. What happens? What? Who are you if you're not doing things for others? Okay. So if if money, you don't need to make a salary. If you don't need to, what is it that defines you as a person? and is not encumbered by the demands of being a professor, a faculty member, a best-selling author, you know, what, uh, a, a, a therapist who has to have the respect of the clients. What is it that makes you want to be a human being? So that's, okay, so what am I working on? I'm working on, in a sense, trying to figure out what are the features of being a human that are really um, generative, and so the, the issue is so many of the people that we interact with do things because it will benefit them. 
And that is really not truly mammalian. <laughs> you know, it's a very, very strange thing uh, because we have to think in terms of the core mammalian feature, which is to give and to support and to empower. And how, how do we empower others to be more than they are, or in a sense to develop, as opposed to being concerned about who we are? So uh, for me, the, so you asked this question, and I'll share with the audience, because uh, uh, many people who know me know that I had a diagnosis a few months ago of prostate cancer, and I had to go through a real personal journey it was a very interesting personal journey. And, of course, diagnosis is frightening. And, of course, it's unpredictable about how your body will react to the fear. And this is truly polyvagal. And sometimes the fear got into my legs, which I knew uh, I was moving towards a shutting down. And uh, What do you, what do you, you mean know, when you say your legs started feeling numb or rubbery, weak? Or rubbery, rubbery, rubbery. Rubbery. You know, people know basically you're really you're losing blood pressure. Your old Vegas is now saying uh, end of story. Freeze. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, immobilize, lo- lose the muscle tone. And what I did was I delayed surgery. I got diagnosed in April, and I delayed surgery until August. And part of the delay was because I, I like many other people, like you, have many obligations, and I. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, give up my obligations, and then I canceled three months of talks and travel, and that was really hard. That was as devastating to me as the diagnosis because, you know, we define ourselves by others. This is really how this journey started to occur. So I started giving uh, – I had a series of talks, on like six or seven talks and a couple of trips to Europe and a variety of things, and I kept the obligations up until the end of July. And it was really interesting because I was giving talks and I was, in a sense, thinking to myself, maybe this is the last time I do this. You know, this is going to be it. And it was like uh, wonderful. I was really saying it was like this connectiveness. It was like just wonderful because I was doing it for the connectedness. And I was, in a sense, loving out and loving in. I was feeling wonderful. And each talk, whether it was at a university in a very, you know, more tighter type groups or was to more alternative groups, it didn't matter. It was still the same, you know, caring and involvement. And so by the time uh, I I went into surgery, I felt in a sense, uh, I felt a validated person. I felt that if I didn't even survive surgery, other than not seeing my kids or my wife, you know, it would be okay. You know, we could do that. The other thing I did, and this goes back to the whole theme of resilience, and where I talked to you before we went on camera, that sometimes the body leads you. Sometimes it's not even your mental thing. Somehow I I started to uh, exercise. This is something that I gave up for several decades. So I actually, uh, we live in North Carolina. It's a beautiful area, and we live 100 yards from the uh, University of North Carolina Wellness Center which I belonged to and didn't use. So I started going there every day and exercising and building up cardiovascular fitness. And I was in really very good fitness by the time I went to surgery. And then I also uh, used uh, uh, visualization tapes. My very good friend, Pat Ogden, who you may also know, uh, sent me some great visualization uh, CDs and they were wonderful because what I was able to do was visualize people caring, loving, and wanting to help. And the medical environment here was exactly like the visualizations. So I went into surgery uh, being a, a collaborator as opposed to being fearful and fighting. And so we started having this whole pathway of understanding of body. And I knew that if my body was scared of surgery, it would tense up and you know, surgery would be more difficult. And I, you know, so I went into surgery and in the operating room when I'm still awake, my heart rate was in the 60s. Okay, Which so it was the, quite low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it, 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 you know, for me, before I started exercise, I hadn't seen that since I was in grad school. You know, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, it, I, I was, I got in really, really good shape. And then I went through surgery, and surgery really wasn't bad. I was home in, a, in 24 hours. And within four weeks, I was back in the gym exercising again. And so I'm back on the elliptical and, you know, I'm feeling really good physically. So the point is that our body, it kind of leads us. Now, I'm not a motivated exerciser. I don't even like to exercise. But my body functionally is leading me there because it is enabling me to do the next things. 
and the next things are to deal with uh, being around for another 20 years, being engaging, doing creative ideas, writing things that people can read and understand. I understand there's an issue, but of course people are reading things that I wrote for the academic scientific community. I have to find the voice. The voice has to be more like the voice I have when I talk, and I'm working on that. And I want these ideas understood and used because they will help people deal with even traditional medical issues. Oh, that's great, Steve. Thank you. And obviously, you've uh, you know, made an enormous contribution. And, uh, you know, at a very personal level, I'm really glad you're doing well. Well, thanks. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to, to, to talk to you face-to-face, and I hope at some time we actually will meet truly face-to-face. That's right. I think about how we evolved, you know, face-to-face, skin-to-skin, heart-to-heart. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think that sometimes people can emphasize one part or other of the human story, and lately there's been a real emphasis on the social aspects of the human story. And yeah. I think it's, of course, important to appreciate that there's a lot of individual variation, and some people are more... Uh, introverted in their nature or engaged with the object world and, and you know, those more solitary, not other referenced experiences are, are central to them. And nonetheless, they're not tortoises. You know, the most introverted uh, human around is, is no tortoise at all, mm-hmm. which maybe that's a segue to our very last question, uh, the one you began to speak to yeah. earlier. Um, as you know, and, other, and people have heard this uh, series before now, uh, I like to think, you know, what can help the world to a soft landing without being grandiose about it or righteous about it? Uh, if it were within your power to nominate to some critical mass of human beings, my personal number is a billion to two billion brains as a kind of tipping point. But if they could do something, anything, for five minutes or less a day, what would you nominate to them? And you already okay. hinted what you had in mind. Well, I'll give you two parts of it. So I, I said b- being uh, feeling safe in the arms of another appropriate mammal. But I would also say that learning how to breathe. And I, I actually do, uh, when, I, when I do workshops, I do a little what I call an experiment. It's a demonstration. And it's very simple. I have people uh, inhale for a short, and, uh, short time and exhale very, very slowly. And I put them face to face, and then I have them reverse that. So they do a, a long, slow inhalation and a rapid exhalation. And you know, both people do both of them. And I ask them, "What do you? What did you experience?" And what they experience is really quite remarkable. That when they do the slow exhalation, they see the person across from them as being loving, caring, and supportive. And when they do the long inhalation and short exhalation, which is turning the vagus off. They see the person as critical, and they're concerned, Did I, am I doing this wrong? Am I not doing this right? And the other part is that even when they're breathing, there's literally a mirroring because people uh, react when people do uh, uh, short, stochastic-like exhalations. So what I would say is be, uh, it's a word, be mindful of your breathing occasionally for a few, few minutes every day and see how you feel when you start to extend the duration of exhalation. And then I would also say, try to do that with, with a significant other and see how you feel. Because part of that long exhalation is, in a way, turning you on to that other person. So we want to be careful that we don't get connected to people we, that, that we shouldn't be around. Right. So the issue is uh, the reciprocity of, of breath, the reciprocity of facial interaction. These are all neural exercises, as is breathing. That's great. So may we... Feel safe in the arms of another while exhaling <laughs> slowly. slowly. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Steve. This was really exceptional. And um, I encourage everybody to uh, not be put off by uh, the polysyllabic uh, terminology of polyvagal theory. It's actually really quite accessible, uh, particularly when you kind of get to the basics that um, you know this whole social engagement system is deeply important in terms of helping us feel safer. And help, and as we help ourselves feel safer, we become more and more accessible for relationship. Both of which help us be more resilient, which is our topic here in this interaction. So again, I really wish you well, Steve, and may Thank you me. live long and prosper. Going back well, to my I, personal geek roots. Well, I hope we have many, many future interactions. And thank you very much for inviting me on this uh, program. Pleasure.